Mr. Investor, welcome back to the channel, baby. Where have you been, cowboy? I went to the Himalayas and I swooped down into the valley like an eagle to swoop up this information. So finally, we're going to be talking about bio nanogenomics and what I think the future game plan is going to be with prenatal screening. So let's look at genetic testing and let's look at the game plan. This is not financial advice. This is for entertainment only. And if you want to support my channel, just click join up here. It's only 99 cents. You can join absolutely any tier and you really help me to create tip top content. So thank you very much to everybody that's supports me big shout out to tmg and freddie lum as well as blue sky on mars but if you're unable to join channel memberships or my patreon just you hitting like and clicking subscribe on this video means the world to me thank you so much for all your support let's get into this so the first thing that i was curious about and i wanted to know was how can bio nanogenomics our beloved get 10,000 sapphire machines installed how can we get worldwide adoption. So I looked at their upcoming milestones and I chose to explore prenatals. So in Q3 2021, we have the commercial release of prenatal assays and the expansion of the menu of pediatric assays. What is going to happen for them? How much money is there? And then the magic happened. The stars had aligned. We had built ourselves into the constellation. Magically, all the bingo cowboys came through swinging. So the messenger of Moistville, everybody's favorite MOM, baby. I was already building out a video on prenatals, but this guy told me to check out this post on StockTwits. He said, check out Cantaloupe. And so I did. And Kevin, aka Cantaloupe, was saying that, bingo, wouldn't it be cute if BioNano and Illumina team up for prenatal testing? to test all newborns as routine. Holy jamole, let's piece together the pie. So in America, we are waiting insurance. So we're looking for these DEX codes to be nationwide. As we can see, Praxis is the first CAP credited CLIA certified diagnostic lab in the United States to develop and offer commercially LDT based on whole genome analysis with Praxis. So we want these Z codes to be nationwide, all states. If genetic testing is reimbursable under insurance, we can see clinics snap up the Sapphire system a lot faster. As we can see here, the Z codes allow for a pathway for Medicare coverage and private insurance reimbursement for OGM with Sapphire of patients with suspected genetic disease. So over here in the UK, I was looking at government plans and guidelines shifting to explore genomics. So imagine in the future, every single baby has prenatal screening for multiple diseases and comorbidities, including rare genetic disease and cancer. Well, it turns out the UK has made its very own G unit. Yes, that's actually an NA NHS genomic unit. But before we get into the G unit, let's see a few seconds of all these screening tests that are offered currently in the UK. So all of these screening tests I'm about to show you is actually built into our national healthcare system, the NHS, and it's all free. Katie is expecting a baby. During her pregnancy, she'll be offered several screening tests to check for health conditions that could affect her or her baby. So this video actually shows you a whole load of screening tests. So the screening tests are used to identify people who have a higher chance of a health problem so they can get earlier and potentially more effective treatment as well as make informed decisions about their health. So there's a lot of different tests that are built into our healthcare system. So I'm just going to show you the ones that would apply to us. 10 and 14 weeks of pregnancy, Katie is offered the combined test. This is an ultrasound scan and blood test, looking for Down syndrome, Edward syndrome, and Patel syndrome. If the combined test cannot be done, she can have the quadruple test up to 20 weeks of pregnancy. This looks for Down syndrome only. When Thomas is five days old, a midwife will offer the blood spot test, also known as the heel quick test. This involves taking a few drops of blood from the heel. It screens for nine rare but serious conditions, such as cystic fibrosis. Remember, screening is always a choice. So next, I found this video. This video contains a presentation from the NHS and it's from the genomics unit, G unit. My name is Ed, I'm Alexandra Picard and I work in NHS England's genomics unit. And this is a new unit that has been recently set up to support the implementation of NHS England's genomic programme. So what they ideally want to do is they want to embed genomics into a clinical service. Starting from, uh, from scratch, from nothing, as many of you will probably be aware, uh, genetic testing has been used in the NHS uh, for some decades. And so all we're doing is building on that. So when we say we're introducing genomic medicine into the NHS, that isn't technically true because it's already been happening what we're doing is kind of embedding it further into a clinical service so then she briefly mentions you know government funding and strategy and how it's paving the way for genomics here 
and this has been built upon uh, by a number of investments from the government um, and strategies setting out the strategic direction, as Ed's just mentioned, Generation Genome and the 100,000 Genomes Project really building um, on what we know about genomic medicine and how we can implement it in the future. So now they outline their basic plan. And what we're trying to do is uh, enable quicker diagnosis and ending the diagnostic odyssey that for many patients goes over months and years, making sure that we can match people uh, to the most effective medications and interventions and increasing people surviving cancer through more accurate diagnosis and precision therapy. So here in the UK, in terms of standards of care, they have changed from a biomedical model back in the day to then moving into a holistic model. And now we're looking at personalized medicine. So personalization and using genomics in practice. So how we're using genomic medicine to lay the foundations uh, for personalized medicine in the future to really drive early diagnosis and a greater diagnostic yield. So I stopped there just to pause on a moment because I looked at their notes here at the side and they're saying that they've got 60% more actionable genes in cancer and they have four to five times increase in rare disease. This is all in terms of diagnosis and also looking at more precision in their diagnosis. So they're identifying underlying cause of disease, segmentation of condition, thus then allowing more effective treatments. They can also look at fewer adverse reactions through identification of predisposition to side effects of medications, and then spot who is eligible for clinical trials, who would be better suited in terms of, you know, characterization of condition and driver targets. And then finally tying into it, they're looking at prognostics, preventative approaches. They wanna identify predisposition markers for disease. Then coming back in, it's going to help earlier diagnose and save lives with many more people in the future. So the next thing I looked at is who's going to pay for all of that? They'll also be uh, supporting the provision of the whole genome sequencing. So I wanted to make sure, are they all going to be on the same page? You know, are they going to have a national providing of the machines? Who's going to be paying for the machines on the system? And will they have all the same machines across the NHS? Will they have access to it? We're going to have a national provider of whole genome sequencing. What we don't want is all the different areas of the country having to buy their own machines and having variation in whole genome sequencing across the country. So we want a national provision um, for that. And if we take a look at what they're currently using or what the plan was back in 2018, and I think they're still using this, let's check it out. But what will happen from the 1st of October is that whole genome sequencing will be available in the NHS as part of routine clinical care. And that's the, uh, that's the real shift. And that we'll have a national network of genomic laboratory hubs to work with. National Genome Hubs, did she just say that? Are we upgrading the levels? We're gonna come back to that after this presentation. And we want to standardize the testing approach so that all patients get the best standard of care. So we want to make sure that it doesn't matter where you are in the country, for a clinical condition, you will have access to a test which offers you the best standard of care. So this is exactly what I was talking about in terms of the standard of care. If they want to have the best outcomes for their patient, they need to make sure they use the genomic toolkit and use all of the machines that are supplementary to making sure they have the correct diagnosis because that's what the patients deserve. So that being said, could you deny a patient, you know, the Sapphire system, if it could be able to diagnose and look at predispositions and find structural variations that can help them obtain diagnosis? thus enabling effective treatment, early stage treatment and saving lives with cancer. But also really importantly in this field, being able to keep up to date uh, with the most appropriate technology. It seems that technology moves incredibly fast in this area, so we need to make sure that we put in place um, a process that enables us to keep up to date with that technology so we're getting the best diagnostic and clinical outcomes. Upgrade your tech to Sapphire then, baby. So guys, when I was in the Festival of Genomics, I heard them talk about, you know, prenatal screening and also talking about um, structuring the guidelines to adopt this. So will we see this around the world? Because it's already shifting over here. If they're going to enable, you know, effective diagnosis for patients, they need to integrate genomics into it and they need to make sure they have all the toolkits available. It'll also include the clinical requirements for accessing a test. So to support clinicians to understand which patient should or should not be having a test. Um, and this will align with NICE guidance and other clinical guidance that's uh, already available. So NICE guidelines, NICE is this governing body. So NICE guidelines are evidence-based recommendations for health and care in England. They set out the care and services suitable for most people with a specific condition or need and people in particular circumstances or settings. They said their guidelines help health and social care professionals to prevent ill health. So another thing that's on our side is um, in terms of affordability. So they want to be specific with a certain type of genes tested 
and they want to be um, the most efficient and affordable. Looking to also standardise the testing available. So will we be really defining what genes uh, need to be tested and by which uh, which platform technology they should be uh, delivered. So this is making sure that patients are getting access to an equitable standard of testing across the country. Um, but we also want to make sure that we get access to the most effective and affordable technologies now and in the future. So we're not looking to evaluate something that in six months to a year down the line is not going to be the most uh, up-to-date technology or the most effective technology. So I believe this is one of the best things about bio-nanogenomics. There's so many publications. We are constantly coming out with all of this evidence that we have, universities and top-level researchers coming out with, you know, great research using the Sapphire machine. There's so much of it. I scroll down this page, there are over 30 pages of publications. And these guys want to see evidence. They want to see clinical-based evidence. They want to see research as to why they should be using these machines. Process potentially could have two key parts so a clinical assessment so an assessment of the effectiveness of the test and the clinical evidence that supports that test so um, I think Jane my colleague who's just joined us from UKGCN has nicely put it does the test do what it says on the tin does it clinically um, do what what it's what is necessary so currently we have sales with Russell Group universities you know these are world-class research intensive universities they're the top universities in the UK from my previous video if you saw at conducting research we are already in there with these guys we are also in there with the NHS Lothian in Edinburgh so I am wondering will we see machines installed on a national scale in England and the nation surrounding it but this will bring together for the first time the not only the evaluation side but the commission side from NHS England so what we'll do on a UK level is make sure that we're assessing the evidence together but then from an England perspective NHS England will be uh, very clearly defining which tests will be commissioned uh, in England and then our partners in the devolved nations will go through their their own governance processes to do that what we're hoping is that it will really clarify um, the landscape in terms of uh, what tests will be commissioned. You see, England was focusing on whole genome sequencing, right? And the G unit, the genomic hubs mentioned earlier, these are seven GLHs, genomic laboratory hubs. And these are scattered across England from Birmingham all the way down to, you know, Guys and St. Thomas Hospital in London, Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children, NHS. And what they're aiming to do is create a world-class genomic testing resource for the NHS and underpin the NHS Genomic Medicine Service. They want to deliver on their commitments as part of the NHS's long-term plan. So as we know, you may have heard this many times before, Cantaloupe had said that bio nanogenomics and Illumina may have a partnership, they may team up. As mentioned before in this article by GeekWire, 75% of structural variants that are present in a person's genome are missed by whole genome sequencing. And as you guys may know, Genomics England and Illumina have partnered already back in 2020 in January to deliver whole genome sequencing for England's NHS Genomic Medicine Service. So this agreement in 2020 said that they're going to deliver up to 300,000 whole genome equivalents for the next five years but there's also an option to increase this to 500,000. So if they want to commit to the guidelines, if they want to commit to you know improved patient outcomes and care, they need to make sure that they do optical mapping alongside whole genome sequencing. As they have stated, the role of NHS England and NHS Improvement is to enable the NHS to harness the power of genomic technology and science to improve the health of our population and deliver on the commitments in the NHS long-term plan. So what they want to do is sequence 500,000 whole genomes by 2023 2024 and help transform healthcare for maximum patient benefit including for all children with cancer or children who are seriously ill with a likely genetic disorder not only that but check this out the bullet point above shows to be the first national healthcare system to offer whole genome sequencing as part of routine care so if we get this if we get a synergistic partnership with Illumina it could be crazy for us because literally they're using this on a national scale they want to use this as part of routine care and when looking into some London hospitals this is University College London. During pregnancy prenatal testing, you will be offered screening tests during pregnancy to try and identify if you or your baby have a higher chance of health problems such as infectious diseases, Downs, Edwards or Pateau's syndrome or physical abnormalities. All screening tests are free. So UCLH, it's a hospital here in London, offers all antenatal and newborn screening tests as recommended by the National Health Screening Committee and adhere to nationally agreed service specifications and standards. So I checked into the UK National Screening 
committee and we saw here that they had a meeting back in 28th of October 2020. This is one of their Google files actually. They had a Microsoft Teams meeting and I wanted to see what they're discussing in terms of screening. So they spoke a little bit about restoration of you know screening programs for C19. They spoke about prostate cancer, oral cancer screenings for adults and then they were speaking about specific conditions for fetal, maternal and child health screening. So the next thing I wanted to look at I wanted to see some numbers. So these are the exact statistics for public healthcare England. This is the antenatal screening standards, official statistics, data report from 2018 to 2019. And here you can see antenatal screening is offered for 17 different conditions to approximately 700,000 pregnant women in England every year. That's 700,000 pregnant women in England, not in the UK, in England only. So if we are able to be part of screening here for pregnant women every single year in the UK, there's potentially 700,000 people that could be using routine screening throughout the pregnancy and after the child is born. So I came back to BioNanogenomics website and I remember they said something. They were talking about 2021 shaping up to be a fantastic year for the global development of sapphire-based assays for use in clinical testing of patients with genetic disease and cancers of the blood. But also this is what I saw here. So on adoption of sapphire for use in larger clinical studies aimed at obtaining critical massive data on sapphire application across key structural variation analysis including prenatal and postnatal genetics. And remember when um, G Unit, the lady in G Unit was talking, she was speaking about, you know, um, they wanted to have this kind of national service where everything is the same, everyone has the same opportunity to get access to these screenings and to utilize genomics in order to, you know, have preventative measures put in place, better diagnosis. So this is only in England, but what if we're talking about the whole of the UK? You know, we're talking about Wales, we're talking about Scotland getting involved too. So if we're talking about routine care, we're talking about, you know, prenatal and postnatals. If we're able just to get, you know, those 700,000 people just in the UK alone and we can cut the cost down to $100 a pop. We are talking about $70 million in revenue from one country alone. So what if we're doing this, you know, worldwide? What if we're doing this in the USA as well? We're doing this in Canada. We're doing this across Europe. You can literally save so many lives and also make a lot of money every single year, every time someone is having a baby. So then I wanted to look at, you know, the prenatal testing market. Let's look at prenatal genomics industry. So here they were stating that it could be, you know, up to 6.47 billion by 2028. And here on a business wire article they're saying by 2027 it will be roughly about you know 6.6 .6 billion dollars we're talking about prenatal diagnostics but then if we look across the other research bodies they were basically valuing prenatal testing and newborn screening the market size is going to be worth 10.85 billion by 2027 and if we look at America we can see there are 3.79 million babies born in 2018 so in terms of antenatal testing they are testing for specific diseases at the moment you can see they're testing here you know t21 t18 t they're testing for specific diseases. So we're talking, you know, genetic diseases such as Down syndromes on chromosome 21, T21. But later down the line, what if we manage to find predisposition for diabetes, for different types of cancer, and we are actually prenatal screening for so many different diseases and comorbidities. This sum of money could be so much larger. And that's just in England alone. What they want to focus on as well is efficiency. So they want to look at, you know, a quick turnover time. And as you can see here, 97% of women with higher chance results offered an appointment within three working days. They're trying to do it as fast as possible and make sure it's accurate and efficient. So ho ho ho, thank you Bruno for sending me this. So are we actually doing this? Are we looking to go into this market? We've said it there that we want to expand into prenatal and postnatal genetics and collect a massive data and our beloved Alka Child Bay actually published with some other scientists. They were exploring optical genome mapping as a next generation cytogenomic tool for detection of structural and copy number variations for prenatal genomic analysis. So they have stated that actually optical genome mapping is being adopted by laboratories as a next generation cytogenomic tool for both postnatal, constitutional genetic disorders and hematological malignancies. And if you look at the study, they said that with non-invasive prenatal screening, NIPT, as the standard of care screening assay for all global pregnancies, we anticipate that OGM as a high resolution cytogenomic diagnostic tool employed following a positive NIPT screen or for high risk pregnancies with an abnormal ultrasound. So they believe that OGM optical genome mapping and the Sapphire tool will be used as a diagnostic tool to supplement positive NIPT. There are always going to be babies, you know, we're going to have children, our children are going to have children for generations to come. So does this mean, you know, annual reoccurring cash flow for us, reoccurring revenue? Because as you can see, when we're talking about non-invasive prenatal screening, they're always testing for stuff that is genetic, you know, they're testing the most common ones are for Down syndrome, Edwards syndrome and Patel syndrome, T21, T18, T13. 
So every single year, about 7.9 million infants, 6% of all worldwide births are born with serious birth defects, with the causes of over 50% of the birth defects are unknown. So we could play a vital part. Now this guy always sends me the best stuff, he also sent me to look at another article. So MOM sent me to Stock Twits to look at Scoop06's um, article that he posted. So an article was posted by this guy called Jason Smith, he's got over 432,000 views of his content and he's been posting since uh, 2013. This guy has stated that there's a 1.4 trillion dollar addressable market. Sapphire has widely been accepted as the new gold standard, that is true, first tier genomic testing. People are stating that to me, lots of people who are genomic scientists are saying you know it will become the cytogenetic new gold standard. Also stating that Sapphire is faster and much less expensive than other options and we're still increasing our throughput and we're looking to bring down the cost too to $100 so can you imagine? So they've stated that they believe the stock price will reach $300 within as few as five years. This guy has been holding the stock since 40 cents and he's saying he's holding long because he knows the true potential value. There are loads of detractors here they said fear is one of them but if you believe that mapping the human genome is a useful predictor of disease and genetic conditions and that a solution that is quicker, cheaper and more accurate than anything else is a good bet then bet on bingo. Yet again there's a lot of talk as well about the nano nozzle and what it could potentially do so of course Bionan has a patent on nano nozzle which will add optical sequencing to sapphire. If we were to do that it would absolutely dominate the genomic sequencing market as well. But for the meantime, if we take a look at this, Cisco Trade Over on StockTwits actually posted this up and this made me very interested because it shows who's buying our machines. Why are they buying our machines? Why are they utilizing it? What is the plan? So if we're looking at our accounts receivable, you can see here as of December 31st, 2020, Illumina and Quest Diagnostics represented 17% and 10.1% respectively of the company's total accounts receivable balance. So these guys bought some machines and they're utilizing our consumables? Man, it smells like partnership baby it smells in the air in other news i don't know if you guys missed this as well university of florida's research they were talking about sweet corn baby a favorite food for many consumers and we have created an even super sweet corn known as super sweet because it has more sugar than other types of staple crop how did they do it researchers extracted dna from a plant grown in the greenhouse they sequenced the genome and then they also used boom bada boom Resende and his team relied on two additional tools known as optical mapping and high c mapping so that looks like BioNano Genomics and PacBio. And just picture this, Florida farmers grow more than 37,000 acres of sweet corn annually. We are being utilized in agrigenomics, baby. I also found another study here talking about new breeding targets using genomic technologies, third generation sequencing for improved reference genomes. So they were talking about using Illumina, allowing the assembly of over 200 plant genomes. They spoke of Oxford Nanopore, and then later on in the article you can see that alongside Illumina sequencing data and the other one using pack bio they used optical mapping bio nanogenomics and this harbored 3000 assembly specific genes as well as over 500 previously identified transposable element families the healthcare market is going to be absolutely disrupted by genomics or so it's going to be life-changing it will change the way it works it's an 11.9 trillion dollar global healthcare market opportunity and when we are able to optically map if we also get the nano nozzle up to date and we can sequence to can you imagine everything that we can discover all those predispositions everything that we can target if genetic editing catches up with us as well it's going to be smoking now finally i just want to thank you guys for watching um we've got into this one already we're just looking to get into this one now so everybody that sent me donations for the first one thank you very much this one is 110 dollars um we've already paid for this one so thank you everybody and if you're able to donate send in by paypal or even just join in channel memberships that's one dollar a month only you'll really help us to get into this and i can just you know share this all with you guys there was also some stuff talking about the dark pool so the dark Dark pools are privately organized financial forum or exchange for trading securities. Dark pools allow institutional investors to trade without exposure until after the trade has been executed and reported. So somebody sent me um, a dark pool listing of trades. It was on this guy's Twitter, Maxwell Trades. And if we take a look, we are actually one of the top ones there. You can see Bingo, Bionanogenomics common stock. And it's a total over-the-counter shares, 1.4 billion. The only thing it doesn't say, you know, buys and sells. We want to see buys and sells. But actually, you know, bingo has been going down a lot. So I don't know what's been going on here. And I don't exactly know what the dark pool involves and how it's going to affect our stock in the short term. So Maxwell Trade said, oh, you wanted dark pool trading information. Here you go. The hedge funds have been manipulating the market through OTC BS synthetic shares. Now we are about to burn them shots to the ground. 
So there's actually a lot of companies on this list as well, including, you know, Zemedica, Sundial, AMC. Is GME on here as well? A lot of companies got smoked, baby. But for me, just know any short-term fluctuations in price, I will be averaging down because my average is still quite high for bio-nanogenomics. I think it's $11 or just under now. I think I got into the $10 range. But whilst the stock is still at this kind of price, I will be averaging down. And just remember, I can't give you financial advice. This video is for entertainment only. But I just want to thank you guys so much for all your support. And if you're unable to donate to the channel, just you hitting like and clicking subscribe on this video means the world to me. Thank you so much for your love and support. Also, guys, if you could hit me up in the comments below, tell me your thoughts and feelings. If I've got anything wrong, if you think I'm missing a piece of the puzzle, just send it my way. I'll be happy to listen. Thank you so much. Love you guys. Mr. Invest a lot. Over and out, baby.